Hello, it's Matt from Jayadu channel. Welcome to the second part of video about basic methods of context interface. In this part, we will cover remaining methods that were mentioned in the beginning of the first part. Those are lookup, create subcontext, destroy subcontext, list and list binding. Let's start with the lookup method and write some code that will retrieve our monkey Steven object that is already saved in .bindings file. After retrieving it, we will simply print it out on the console together with its class name. Now I'm going to run this example. As you can see, lookup operation returned a reference object. It's not surprising that this reference contains three addresses with types name, favorite fruit and likes bananas. I think that we'll both agree that it would be much more convenient if in this case the object returned from lookup method was actual instance of monkey class with populated fields. Let's stop for a moment and go back to references. When monkey object was saved in a naming service, in this case a file system, what was actually saved was its state, represented by a reference, created by a method that we had implemented earlier. So during a lookup operation, this reference is retrieved and it has to be handled somehow if we want to get an instance of monkey class. In JMDI, this is responsibility of classes implementing object factory interface. One gets some information about an object and returns actual object. More detailed information about object factories will be presented in a separate video in the future that will exclusively cover object factories. Let's go back to our code and create an object factory for objects of class monkey. To do it, we need to implement an object factory interface. It defines one method that will get a reference and handle it. Its first parameter is an object that in our case will be a reference. In this video this is the only parameter that we will care about. A good practice is to check here if this object is an instance of reference class. If it's not, we'll return a null and in general that means that this object factory could not resolve an object. It doesn't mean that whole process of resolving an object will end. Maybe there is another object factory that can handle that case. Let's cast this first object to a reference type. Now we'll check if this reference is a reference of monkey class. Although in our example it won't be a reference of any other class, in general, if this example were more complex, such validation is required. After this we can go to actual creating an instance of monkey class. We need to handle all reference addresses, and even though we know that first address is a name, the second is a favorite fruit and so on, we don't need to rely on it. We can iterate through all addresses, using enumeration written by method getAll. Just before handling those addresses, I will go back to our monkey class and extract hardcoded strings that specify address types to a constant static fields. So, if during iterating through addresses enumeration, an address is a name, then we interpret it as a name. If it's a favorite fruit property, we interpret it as a favorite fruit. And finally, if it's like bananas boolean, we handle it as a like bananas field. In the end, we return constructed object and that's all that we need to do in this object factory. The only thing that is left is telling JNDI 
that the factory that should be used for references of monkey class is monkey factory that we have just created. We specify it in our reference object by supplying full class name of monkey factory as a second parameter of a constructor. In this case, we also need to specify from where this factory should be loaded. And since in this case it is available on project's class path, we can simply pass here the null value. Before running our example, I will just generate two string method in monkey class. Now let's fire it. As you can see, lookup method still returns a reference object. It is because a reference that is stored inside dot bindings file was created back in the time when we didn't specify monkey factory class during creating a reference. It means that to observe expected result, we need to rebind the monkey object to make sure that the reference will contain a monkey factory class as its factory. Ok, now let's run it again. Now, the monkey Steven object was looked up successfully and contains correct values of its fields. If you now look into the .bindings file, you will see that there is one additional field. It relates to a factory that will handle retrieving monkey Steven object from a naming service. In the next section of this video, we will discuss two methods regarding subcontext. First of them is create subcontext that creates in a given context a subcontext with specified name. We may for example create in our initial context a new subcontext name a new one. In case of a file system, a subcontext is simply a file system's directory. So a new directory will be created. We may also create it on deeper levels. In my D drive, I have a Dropbox directory. Executing this fragment of code would create a new directory inside Dropbox directory. Please note that in case of a name that consists of more than one component, all intermediate contexts must already exist, and only last component will map to correspondent directory. In this example, if I had a Dropbox directory, it wouldn't create a new subcontext, but it would throw an exception instead. Behavior of destroy subcontext method is very similar. We will destroy a new directory created on my D drive earlier. It can be done by this line of code. Also in case of names with more components, all intermediate context must exist, and only the context represented by the last component will be removed. We can execute this piece of code and a directory that has been created before a moment inside Dropbox directory will be removed. Please have in mind that we cannot delete something that is not a context with this method. So in file system example, this method can't be used to remove a file or any custom object bound inside .bindings file. To do this, you need to use unbind method that we have discussed before. Now let's go to the last section of this movie and let's look at two methods that allow you to look for all bindings of some context. Method number one is list method. It takes a parameter that specifies a context in which we will list all data. If we want to look through current context, we simply pass an empty string. In this example, we will list all elements in a D directory. Similarly as in iterating through reference addresses, 
Here we'll also get enumeration of elements representing what's stored in a context. Data for each element are represented by instances of name class power class that has few useful fields. In this example, for each element we will list its name relative to the context and class of the object that is bound to this name. Note that there is no possibility to access actual object through this type of listing. Run this example and look at the output. All files and directories have been printed since they belong to context that is represented by root directory of D drive. Also, there is one object binding that we have created through bind method, our monkey Steven. Note that all objects that represent files are actual references to those files, while directories are JNDI's context. If you will look at the top of the output, you will notice the dot bindings file. Let's enhance this example and assume that for each encountered file object, we will display its size. Since to do this operation we need an end object, list method won't be useful. For this problem, method list bindings must be used. Another change we will introduce is displaying Steam directory content instead of a root directory of D drive. We will solve this whole problem by modifying a previous example. First, we need to use list bindings method instead of a list. Then, since we want to list Steam directory, its name must be passed as a name to this method. Note that even though we are working with initial context that represents root directory, we may access content of any subcontext. We just need to pass a name of this context relative to current one. This method returns also an enumeration, but that consists of binding objects. Another thing we will change is the use of naming enumeration instead of pure Java enumeration. This class extends classical enumeration by providing you the same methods, but that allow to catch and handle JNDI's exceptions. Anyway, we won't handle it, so it's just set for your record. Binding class allows to perform the same operations as name class fair class plus one additional, that is accessing actual object of the binding. This is where we will retrieve a file object. Of course, we will do it after verifying if the object is an instance of the file class. If so, we will print its size. For this purpose, we will use length method of Java IO file class. Of course, before accessing it, we need to cast binding object to actual file class. Note the nature of get object method of binding class. In general, it can return any type of object that can be stored in JNDI. Let's just add a new line printing and run this example. All objects of Steam context are listed and all files have their size printed. That's all for this video. You should have now a basic knowledge about context interface and starting our work with JNDI by creating initial context. Even though we have worked with a file system, all topics we have covered also apply to other naming systems. This is because as I said in introduction to JNDI, JNDI is just an interface. Thanks for watching, stay tuned, and see you in the next episode.